Welcome everyone to UCLA Global Conversation with, with Ambassador Nina Hachijin, Developing Global Leaders, A View from Los Angeles. My name is Cindy Fan. I'm Vice Provost for the UCLA International Institute. I'm also Professor of Geography and Professor of Asian American Studies. As a land grant institution, the International Institute at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovanga. A joint initiative of the US Department of State and Department of Education, International Education Week, or IEW, is a time to celebrate the benefits and importance of international education and exchange around the world. Allow me to share part of a recent statement from the two departments. I quote, many of our most pressing challenges are inherently global in scope and impact and can only be addressed by nations and individuals working together from tackling pandemics and the climate crisis to reducing economic disparities and building prosperity to countering threats that, to democracy and maintaining peace. Resolving these global challenges requires partnership and collaboration across border, borders. End quote. At UCLA, whose mission is the creation, application, dissemination, and preservation of knowledge for the betterment of the global society, the International Institute and its partners have led the IEW initiative since 2016. This week, 44 events organized by 52 campus units, ranging from lectures to cultural performances and exhibits, and from student and career panels to scholarship workshops offers something to everyone interested in education, research, and service using a global perspective. And it's not too late to sign up for these events. The link to the events is in the chat. The Global Conversation is the week's highlight, and we're delighted to have Ambassador Nina Hachijan as our feature speaker today to discuss global leadership based on her diverse government service and her vantage point in the global city of Los Angeles. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Manny Jad, Jamaica Vegas, Peggy McInerney, Kaya Mentisulu, Catherine Paul, Oliver Chen, Alex Zhu, and the team at the Deputy Mayor's Office, especially Anne Tran, who, by the way, is a Bruin. I also like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. To submit questions to Ambassador Hachijin, please use the Q&A function. As time allows, she will address as many questions as possible using the Q and A during the Q and A session. And we will be recording this webinar, and we'll share the link after the event. Now it's my honor to introduce Ambassador Nina Hachijan. In 2017, Mayor Eric Garcetti appointed Ambassador Nina Hachijan to be the first Deputy Mayor of International Affairs for Los Angeles. In fact. Los Angeles led the nation in creating this position. Ambassador and Hachijian and her team connect the world to LA and LA to the world. They build relationships with foreign partners to bring more jobs, opportunities, cultures, ideas, and visitors to LA and to elevate the city's international leadership, including on climate, inclusion, and innovation. They're also laying the foundations for Angelinos to welcome the world for the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And from 2014 to 2017, Ambassador Hachijin served as the second US ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN. And during her tenure, the United States established a strategic partnership with ASEAN, held the first leaders summit in the United States, launched a presidential initiative on economic cooperation, established the US ASEAN Women's Leadership Academy and grew the youth program to over 100,000 members. And she was awarded the State Department's Superior Honor Award for her service. Earlier, Ambassador Hachijin was a senior fellow and a senior vice president at the Center for American Progress, focused on Asia policy and US-China relations. And prior to that, she was the director of the RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy for four years. She served on the staff of the National Security Council in the Clinton White House from 1998 to 1999. Ambassador Chijin is also the editor of the book, Debating China, the US-China Relationship in 10 Conversations, published by Oxford University Press in 2014 
and co-author of The Next American Century, How the U.S. Can Strive as, as Other Powers Rise, published by Simon & Schuster in 2008. She also founded a number of boards and councils, including the State Department's International Security Advisory Board, Women Ambassadors Serving America, and Leadership Council for Women in National Security Board. And she is an advisory board member of the Pacific Council on International Policy, Foreign Policy for America, and National Security Action, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Ambassador Hachijin received her BS from Yale University, Mac Magna Cum Laude, and her JD from Stanford Law School with distinction. Without further ado, I, I would now like to invite Ambassador Hachijin to join me in a conversation. Ambassador Hachijin, thank you for joining us today. Oh, I'm, so <laughs> I'm so impressed with your long-standing and, and multifaceted contributions to public service and international relations in your various positions past and present. And that's including your scholarly contributions. Um, I can't think of a better person to talk about global leadership and how to develop global leaders. Well, thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. And uh, you, you've done wonderful work at UCLA. And I know that you know UCLA grads are all over the world changing it uh, for the better. So I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me start with your role as ambassador. Um, Please tell me how you became an, an ambassador and, and what were the roles of your education and upbringing in your career choice? Um, it, it was a bit of an indirect route, I, I will say. Um, I mean, I did grow up, you know, the, the daughter of a, an immigrant on one side and on the other side, my grandparents were immigrants. And so I had a fair amount of exposure to different cultures. I was lucky enough to travel to visit my grandparents uh, regularly. Um, my parents were also really avid um, <laughs> aficionados of different kinds of food. So we, and I grew up in New York, so we found ourselves in different parts of the city where you know, other languages were spoken. So, um, so I had that, but then you know, when, I, when I went to college, I was a biology major. I actually got a BS. Um, not that I had any plans to do anything with a biology degree, but I just really liked it. Um, and then, you know, I worked on Capitol Hill. That was my first job. And I think that gave me the bug um, about politics and policy um, and went to law school um, because the people in between college and law school were all had grad had law degrees. And I really admired the way they thought. And it didn't, I didn't really occur to me that, that none of them were practicing lawyers. So when I graduated, I had a wonderful clerkship uh, here in LA and then worked for a firm for a little while and realized that was really not you know, what I was interested in. Um, and so my husband and I moved to Washington and long story short, I had a job at the Federal Trade Commission, which was doing an international antitrust policy, um, but a lot of domestic antitrust policy as well. And then I just got kind of lucky that, um, I'm giving you the long version of this story. <laughs> I got lucky. That's got okay. That's okay. Uh, Take all your time. At the National Security Council. Um, and that's when I realized it wasn't international law that I was interested in. It was international policy. Um, and so came back to Los Angeles and had a fellowship with the Pacific Council and then ended up working at RAND. And so and that set me on my track of really working on foreign policy. Um, and uh, I, you know, I had young kids when President Obama won, so I didn't want to go into the administration at that point, but threw my hat in the ring in his uh, second term. And then again, just got lucky uh, and was asked to do this, this job as ambassador to ASEAN, which was a really good fit for me because I was, you know, a foreign policy wonk. Uh, and uh, it's not a particularly glamorous job. Jakarta is a wonderful city, but not a, you know, not, not a glamorous city, I guess, uh, most of it, uh, but fantastic. And so it was a really wonderful experience for me. Um, it was so interesting. Um, but anyway, that's how I landed there. Not a direct, not a direct path. And I will say uh, for the students who are listening, um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not one of those people who had a five-year plan or a 20-year plan you know, I, I really just tried to do the next thing that was most interesting to me that really pulled me the most. And that has worked out so far relatively well. Um, 
And so if you're not that kind of person, you don't necessarily need to be to uh, end up in jobs that are really satisfying. That's great. Um, I On Monday, I believe, yesterday, right? <laughs> we had a um, sort of alumni career panel as part of the International Education Week. And one of the questions actually coming from the students to recent alumni you know, who already have a job is, is sort of how do you plan ahead, right? You know, how do you know five years from now, 10 years from now, what are you gonna be doing? So I think your example, your experience actually speaks to those students because your career trajectory is one that you didn't really plan ahead when you were a biology major, when you, even when you were in law school. And then you just took the opportunities that were presented to you and, and they all kind of make sense. They all kind of, they all become a coherent component, uh, coherent components of, a, of your career. Right. So, so I, thank mean, you for I mean, I just want to be, clarify one thing, which is I wasn't passive. It's not as if I was kind of waiting for opportunities. I was out there kind of, trying to figure out what they were by talking to people and keeping in touch with people and, you know, the standard stuff. Uh, and, and that's what, you know, that's what kind of helped me get, get the opportunities. So um, it's not, a, it's not exactly a passive approach, but it's also not a very planned one. Right. And, and again, um, I'm, I'm thinking about that particular panel that I attended. Um, the students were also very much the uh, uh, emphasizing on networking, the importance to to, to get to know people and know what's out there because because you otherwise you become very passive right so you spoke about jakarta um which is a very crowded city of course <laughs> uh, the traffic i would say is probably as bad as that of los angeles pre-pandemic uh maybe maybe even worse it's now. worse Actually. yeah it's worse <laughs> <laughs> but but you were ambassador for a group of country right asean and, and can you speak to what it means um, to be an ambassador for a group of countries uh, as opposed to being an ambassador for one country? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I love this kind of work, which we would call multilateral work. Um, the focus is different. So it the focus is on, you know, what can this group of countries all together and the United States agree on to, to work on together, you know, given our priorities uh, that will advance US interests. So that was basically my chief um, you know, my, my chief uh, operating guide, right? And that's different from a single country where the job of the ambassador is to, you know, meet the leadership of that country, meet the people and advance US interests in the context of just, you know, this bilateral relationship. You always have to take into account, you know, the, the regional dynamics and all that. But um, it, it was at the time, the only kind of permanent, is that true? Yeah, I think the only permanent kind of multilateral job in Asia, um, where there, there have been more and more history of them and more of them in Europe. Um, and, and so it's, uh, it's less deep in terms of any one country, in terms of what I knew and who I knew. Um, but what I, but I was kind of focused across uh, the 10 countries of, um, you know, what they all had in common and what we had in common with them that we could work on together. And, and was there anything that was um, that surprised you when you were in that job? Um, yeah, I'll tell you the first thing that came to mind, which was how important fishing is. Uh -huh. um, I, I guess I, if you had asked me, I probably could have figured that out, but I, I it, it's, um, it's critical to almost all those countries. It's actually critical to all of them if you include one, in, you know, in terms of rivers and stuff as well. Um, and it really complicates the the politics um, around the South China Sea or vice versa. Um, there's not a lot of incentives for countries to curb their overfishing and illegal fishing. Um, and uh, there's other countries outside that do a lot of illegal uh, and uh, underreported and overfishing in, in the South China Sea. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I didn't, I didn't realize how big a piece of the picture that that would be. Well, of course, you know, I can, um, as a geographer, you know, I pay attention to uh, not only where countries are, but the size of the countries and, you know, what, 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 what are the economic activities and so on. Of course, Indonesia from east to west is as big as the United States from east to west, right? And so, but but much of 
Indonesia's territory, it's uh, islands, consists of islands, thousands and thousands of islands. So, and therefore, of course, fishing must be very important. And that's just uh, uh, for one country and there are other countries in ASEAN, of course. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think geography is important. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess I could also say to answer your question that I mean the just the, the the incredible diversity of Southeast Asia was was I mean I read up on it so I kind of expected it but it's incredible like incredible diversity of of religion and of um, socioeconomic status uh, and of you know industry and of, I mean just across the board like it's a really diverse region and it's impressive that these ten countries decided that you know they are not going to uh, they're not going to, you know, use force to decide their disputes. They're going to just, they're going to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And uh, that has created this really stable environment that um, has allowed those economies to, to take off. And, and of course, Los Angeles is also very diverse. And so, uh, so closer to home, let's talk about Los Angeles a little bit. Um, why was there a need to create an office of international affairs for the city? And and what does your office do? Sure. Um, so uh, I think Mayor Garcetti wanted to take advantage of all the incredible global assets that we have here in Los Angeles. And so that would include our airport, which is the third busiest in the world. It would include our huge diaspora populations and the fact that you know some 200 languages are spoken in our schools, um, our port that's the busiest in the Western Hemisphere, um, and our just our, our geography that is so connected to the Pacific Rim and also to Latin America, although we have lots of European activity too, um, and the cons we have a hundred consulates. So um, we had not been as a city taking kind of sy systematic um, advantage of all of that incredible global connectedness. Um, and so we focus on four goals. Uh, one is to create jobs and economic opportunities. The second is to give young people in Los Angeles international uh, um, experiences um, or skills. Uh, the third is to work with um, global partners on solving um, global problems that affect Los Angeles, like climate change. And the final one is to support our, our partners, both international and domestic. And that, you know, includes, um, it includes the State Department and the NSC these days, it includes the UN, it includes all the consulates, um, many countries that we partner with and cities that we partner with, um, and all the organizations here, including UCLA and um, and institutions of higher learning. So those are our four main goals. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, we, we execute them in different ways. That, that's great. And, um, and you were uh, asked to be uh, the inaugural deputy mayor and why did you decide to take the job? Oh, well, it's too good not to. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't planning on it, but, it, but um, you know, the mayor made me an offer I couldn't refuse because it's working for him and I'm, you know, just a huge fan of him. I've become even more amazed with his uh, leadership and management um, abilities, you know, the four years that I've worked for him now. Um, and uh, it was starting something, which is something I really like. I, I like getting in on the ground floor of uh, organizations and institutions. And then it was, you know, getting to to do international affairs in my city. Um, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, there are not a ton of opportunities uh, to do that in Los Angeles. I hope over time that we change that. Um, and all of you, you know, folks listening out there, you know, you should start stuff uh, and let us help you build it. Um, uh, so, um, so yeah, it was just kind of a perfect a perfect job. So um, I was intrigued by your comment on there, there aren't a ton of opportunities uh, to do international work in Los Angeles. Can you elaborate a little bit uh, on that? I mean, given the fact that this is a city with, you know, a lot of um, immigrants, diaspora communities. So can we do international work, global work with them as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's not that there are no opportunities. I just think that for a city of our size, second largest in the United States, and for a city of our incredible global connections that I just you know listed only fraction of them, um, that we haven't yet as a city developed the institutions. So the big nonprofits, so the humanitarian organizations, the think tanks, uh, the track two dialogues, the um, you know uh, multiple master's degrees in IR and international relations, um, uh, you know an organization exclusively focused on bringing opportunities to young uh, to you know to K through eight whatever students that are international and other cities that are less global than we are that are smaller than we are have these things, mm-hmm. um, and so you know my. The, the big goal that I always have in the back of my head is creating uh, jobs for students like yours uh, who want to work in, in the field of international relations. Um, so there are many opportunities that are here, right? We have, the, you know, many global companies and we have, you know, diaspora organizations and we have, you know, um, a few like independent institutions, some of which do international work, the Pacific Council, RAND and, and others. Um, but I just think for a city of this size, there should be more. And I hope over time, um, there will be more. And we, we actually just launched a program this morning called Global LA, uh, which is to attract foreign businesses and nonprofits and social enterprises and entrepreneurs to come to Los Angeles and set up here. And so that is an an organization, a new public private partnership that I hope will help um, to create these these opportunities. Um, We were, we today announced this at the headquarters of VinFast, which is a Vietnamese electric car company that announced today that they are going to have their global headquarters uh, in or their North American headquarters in Los Angeles. And so they're going to create a thousand jobs in California and uh, invest $200 million here. So that's the kind of work that we are trying to do to, um, uh, to build on the ties that we have. That's wonderful news. Congratulations for starting this. I think this is really good for the economy, for jobs, for, like you said, um, networking uh, throughout, throughout the world. But um, if I can, you know, kind of maybe um, continue this line of, uh, of, of topics as far as um, the city of Los Angeles compared to other cities, you know, whether they are West Coast or, or East Coast cities, actually, yeah, let, let's think about the, the East Coast versus the, uh, not versus, but East Coast compared to, to the West Coast. Um, there seems to be a perception that um, a lot of the international activities in this nation, you know, happen in the East Coast. And, and, and that the East Coast is sort of the hub of international activities, including education about international work. How accurate is this perception? And, and you know, what does the West Coast offer uh, for students interested in pursuing an international career? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, historically that that is probably accurate. Um, and it also depends on what you mean by international activities. So. There is a lot of international activity happening in this city every day, Um, but it is not in the Council on Foreign Relations, for example, right? And that's what I meant by these institutions. Like we have the Pacific Council on International Policy, um, which does an incredible job in the World Affairs Council, Town Hall, but we don't have 10 of them, right? We have a couple of them, whereas, you know, New York or Washington may have a lot more. And of course, the, you know, the State Department is located in Washington, DC, um, although they do have an office in uh, Los Angeles um, and a bunch of other cities. Um, So I think uh, if you're talking about traditional foreign relations, you know, with embassies and diplomats and and all that, a lot of it does happen in Washington, DC. Um, But if you're thinking about the new economy and new ways of communicating and the metaverse, um, Barbados just became the first country to have an embassy in the metaverse, I learned earlier today, um, you know, then we're where it's at. Um, and if you want to talk about art and sports and food, and uh, that's all here and it's all global. Um, so I'm looking to try, I want to do some of the more traditional work as well. And I want that to, to be located in Los Angeles. But um, sustainability is another example where 
you know, it's incredible what Los Angeles is doing and what its leadership has been. So the mayor brought a thousand cities to cop, to pledge our mayor, to pledge that they would be uh, their fair share of half by 2030 and net zero by 2050. A thousand cities it took a lot of work uh, to put that campaign together. Um, and that's because of LA's leadership. And it's because we've done the work here, the hard work of making sure that we're doing as much as we can uh, to fight climate change. So uh, there are a few, there are areas where, you know, the global center is here in Los Angeles. Um, and I hope that there'll be more and more areas like that. So um, you, you're absolutely right that, you know, we have um, so much to offer. The city has so much to offer, but it, is, it sounds like uh, we do need to have a systematic approach and building institutions that kind of uh, gel all these, uh, you know, potential together, right, to offer more opportunities, um, especially to, to our students. And, uh, you know, before this webinar, you and I spoke a little bit about our next generation, young people, um, we, we sort of need to count on them to sort of fix the world, so to speak. <laughs> so, um, and I know that your office has done a lot in working with students and um, uh, sort of helping them to think about going into a career that helps uh, internationally. Uh, and, and can you speak a little bit about the programs that you've, uh, you've launched? Sure, sure. Um, so, uh... A few different things. So we always have interns, right? So that's a, you know not a huge number of people, but we always have interns, and and they're hugely helpful to us. We have worked with cohorts of students on our work on the sustainable development goals. So these are our seventeen goals that the whole world is measuring their progress by. We're we were I don't know if we're still the only city. For a long time, we were the only city that had a dedicated portal to measuring our goals, um, and we're one of very few cities that's done it very systematically. Anyway, so we had cohorts of students helping us and doing projects. Um, so that was the second way. Then we created this program called the Mayor's Young Ambassador Program. And that um, sends low-income community college students on their very first trips um, overseas. And so for many, that was the first time they were on an airplane, first time they had a passport. Um, and so, and these were completely free trips that, and we, um, we organized them uh, with countries um, and we went to seven different countries before COVID and we're going to start again this coming summer. Um, very, I mean, for those of you who've had a chance to travel, you know how very eye-opening uh, it is. So, and then we, we did a program where we were partnering consulates and high schools um, and we will start that again uh, once, you know, things have settled down a little bit more in terms of COVID. Um, so that was another example. Then during the midst of COVID, um, we created a, um, a two week seminar series with a different person every day for like an international career fair. And UCLA was one of our partners. Uh, we partnered with just, just about every institution of higher learning in Los Angeles and um, had a different, a different kind of international um, person speaking every day about the different kinds of international careers that there are. So that was, um, you know, another one of our efforts. But, um, you know, it's really important to us uh, that we are giving young people the, uh, these opportunities. And uh, so we've, um, so anyway, it's one of our, our top focuses, FOSI. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting UCLA to be a uh, part of uh, that program. And I, I was very happy when I heard about this program, especially the goal of the program. I, I believe the goal is really to, to diversify, you know, the, the pipeline for international careers. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was really targeted to black and brown students in particular. Um, yes. And, and I hope that you continue that program next year. Good, good. Well, but with your help, we will be able to do that. And um, uh, well, I also know that you, you know, you've been involved in a lot of work that um, aim at um, gender equity and uh, both previously before you were a deputy mayor and also uh, when you were in this office. So can you talk about gender equity in international work? Sure. Um, I mean, it is a historically, uh, it's a place where historically women are underrepresented. Um, so, when I was, and women, and particularly women of color, 
Uh, so when I was ambassador, we created the Women's um, uh, Women Ambassadors Serving America, which is, you know, uh, just a group for women to get together and talk about their, you know, their challenges, lots of war stories from earlier years and, but, a, you know, a support network and a place where we could do certain things together. And then um, we I started with some friends, uh, the Leadership Council for Women in National Security, which is now a proper uh, 501c3. Uh, and um, it, uh, its, its focus is to get more women into senior positions uh, in national security. And uh, we got all the candidates to pledge that they would strive for half. Um, and the, the Biden administration is doing pretty well, I would say. Um, I haven't looked, we have, a, we have an actual, you can check it out, it's lcwins.org and we have a, an actual like tracker um, and I haven't tra looked recently, but um, you know, having uh, an African-American woman be our ambassador to the UN, Janet Yellen being our treasury secretary, um, uh, Kathy Hicks being the, the, the deputy director of defense. So, and lots of ambassadors and lots of, you know, assistant secretaries as well. Uh, and senior directors, uh, majority senior directors in the White House uh, at the National Security Council are women. So um, that was a big focus. Uh, and Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley was one of um, one of the co-collaborators on this project, and she is now the first uh, chief uh, diversity officer um, that the State Department has ever had. Uh, and she's doing, you know, wonderful work. I am sure. That, that's wonderful. And of course, you yourself, you know, uh, are very much a role model uh, for, for our students, for women, and, um, and it's, it's wonderful to, to have you also uh, sort of, yeah, being involved in efforts to, uh, to involve more students from uh, underrepresented sort of uh, backgrounds and uh, including women uh, into international work. And um, I think earlier you talked about a program that uh, helped students to actually travel overseas, especially uh, those who have not traveled overseas themselves uh, uh, under other circumstances. So um, the statistic that I remember, and that's pre-pandemic, pre for US student undergraduates um, studying abroad was only 10%, okay? So that's really low. And um, UCLA's percentage is a little higher, it's 25%, but still, you know, there's a lot more we can do. So uh, one of our uh, goals uh, at UCLA International Institute is to, is to raise funds um, to support more students studying abroad uh, for credit, and not just Good. for travel, but for credit. Glad to hear that, that's terrific. Yeah, um, I think they, and, there's nothing, there's just no, unfortunately, you know, because there is, of course, carbon associated with flying anywhere, um, but there is just no substitute for being there, um, unfortunately. And, you know, I, we do a lot more by Zoom than we ever did before. Um, and I think that's really healthy and good, um, uh, but it doesn't take away the need to once in a while actually visit a place. Yes. Um... Because the the sort of you know I will I will argue that uh, being uh, away you know studying abroad is 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 part of diversity right it's diversity because uh, you're in a in a uh, setting you're in an environment that's completely different you know from maybe your upbringing you're all of a sudden outside a comfort zone and so you have to deal with that as a student and and then also uh, for international work diplomacy I think people to people right once you're once you're friends with people, I think it's less likely that you think about, you know, violence and things like that. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Um, you know, I think that those uh, informal bonds can be helpful um, in, in, you know, in negotiations and intense situations. Yes, yes. Um, so there are a couple of questions coming in for you, Ambassador Hachijin, but, but before I get to those questions, um, I wanted to mention to those uh, who are uh, attending that UCLA does have a State Department diplomat in residence. And so for students who are considering being Foreign Service um, officers, uh, please check the chat window for, for the email address of the um, State Department diplomat in residence. So I think one of my colleagues here is going to include, uh, yeah, there you go, in the chat. Um, so Ambassador Hachijin, what hurdles have you faced as a woman throughout your career? Um, it's interesting that at the time I didn't 
most of the time realize that it was because I was a woman, but in retrospect, I think it absolutely was. Um, you know, I had the classic thing of like making points and then having someone else make the same point, a man and having, you know, him get all the credit for it. Um, or, you know, and that my point, uh, really just wasn't heard at all. And I always thought, well, maybe I'm just not communicating well. Um, but in, in fact, it, it <laughs> in fact, I think in retrospect, it was really, uh, just my gender. Um, uh, you know, it's mostly stuff like that. Like I've been very lucky. I've never been a victim of, you know, sexual assault, uh, you know, in the workplace and, um, you know, haven't had anything blatant. Um, but I would say generally just, you know, not being taken as seriously or um, not, uh, you know, um, not being listened to. Uh, I had the classic thing where I went to a doctor's appointment when I was ambassador in ASEAN and um, the, you know, uh, the person there was said, oh, you, so you work for the ambassador. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm the ambassador. <laughs> um, you are the ambassador. <laughs> and, and, you know, I had a number of uh, my great staff who would, you know, they rec they kind of saw this dynamic and they would just push me forward and say, here's my boss, the ambassador. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, very, you know, I had a great team. Yeah, um, you know, I hear you. I, I, I too myself, you know, have been in situations in which uh, it was my idea, but you know, other people sort of get credit for my idea. <laughs> um, so now more questions coming in. Um, a lot of questions actually. Um, can you say something about, did you have a role model? Did you have mentors that really make the difference in your, in your career? Uh... Yes, I had many mentors who made a huge difference in my career, um, if nothing else than just to be a sounding board for me. Many of them were men um, who, you know, gave me great opportunities, but um, lucky to have good women mentors too. I mean, I think my mom was a role model for me because she worked uh, and, you know, she slogged it out in 1970s corporate America uh, <laughs> with those goofy ties that she had to wear and like, you know, it was awful. Uh, um, and she had kind of horrible bosses and whatever. So she she certainly did. I remember when I was little, like Eleanor Roosevelt was kind of the only, per, you know, just like the only kind of international woman out there, uh, American. Um, uh, now, you know, there's so many more. I'm so happy about that. It's like actually, you know, more common than not these days that the uh, Secretary of State's a woman. So, um, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm really happy for the improvement in the number of international American role models. And, and internationally too, right? Other countries as well. Of course. Oh, other countries are way ahead of us. I guess yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, in terms of women, you know, heads of state, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Uh, and um, there's a question about uh, Los Angeles investment. How can LA invest more efforts in, um, in sorry, more efforts in transatlantic relations. Um, it, seem, it seems as if that part of the world is focused on the East Coast. So it's sort of a continuation of my questions about the East Coast, but more on about international relations. Yeah, interestingly, I, I had my first international trip uh, a couple of weeks ago to Berlin, um, which is one of our sister cities. And um, there is, uh, I, I know there are a bunch of French and uh, German and, um, other European establishments in Los Angeles. There's the Goethe uh, Institute, there's the Thomas Mann House, um, and uh, there's a former ambassador to Germany who lives here, John Emerson, um, and his wife, Kimberly Emerson, who was really involved uh, also. And I was asked to be on this um, new program with a group called Atlantic Rücke, uh, which is a German think tank membership kind of organization that's dedicated to transatlantic relations. And um, they have a new program to send um, a more diverse slate of Ameri young Americans um, to uh, Europe. And so they had their first inaugural class and I you know, met with them. We did a panel discussion with them. I had some dinner with them and they were a really great group of young people from across the United States. Um, 
So uh, I will continue to be, you know, looking for Angelinos to nominate to that program, for example. Um, but we actually do quite a bit with, um, with Europeans. Um, I am not going to announce what we're doing, but this week, um, keep your eyes peeled for something having to do with the UK, um, the United Kingdom. Um, there's going to be a little, you know, thing that hasn't happened before happen this week. Um, with the mayor and a minister who is coming over from the UK. Um, and we have, you know, a wonderful uh, consul general from the UK here also that we do uh, a lot of work with. They've been helping us with the, with the games, with the Olympic and Paralympic games and thinking about that, you know, how we, how we do, uh, how we take lessons that London learned um, when they were doing it, especially in terms of legacy, how to make sure that Los Angeles is better, you know, after the party is over um, and that, yeah, Angelinos get opportunities leading up to the games uh, as well. So there's actually more going on than you might think. Um, and I would just, you know, think about, uh, you know, trying to get on the, the the newsletter of the French consulate or the UK consulate or the, um, you know, any of the any of the European ones are all here um, uh, because they always want to have people coming to their events and announcing what they're up to. So uh, you can get involved fairly easily. Well, these are all exciting news and uh, I'm going to keep my eyes open, like you said, about uh, all these um, uh, new announcements that you'll be making. Um, so there are, uh, there are questions coming in about uh, particularly re uh, regarding students, opportunities for students, right? I think you mentioned earlier about the internship opportunities with your office. Can you say uh, more about that? Yeah, well, we just have interns, you know, that, that help us do our work and we're a relatively small shop. So, um, you know, uh, it's, you know, it can be, you know, grunt work and kind of boring work, but it can also be really interesting sitting in on meetings and stuff. You have to be, you have to be willing to do the whole range of things, uh, like, you know, setting up glasses of water for people who are coming in or whatever, but also, uh, you know, getting to do some interesting research about, you know, one facet or another or something that we need to know. Um, so, so that's, you know, pretty straightforward. And you, the, uh, the address is mayor.international at lacity.org um, if you're interested in internship opportunities. Um, and, uh, and then again, like I was saying earlier, we, we sometimes have cohorts, uh, classes of, of students doing research. So if you're, you know, if you have a, uh, an international relations related class, um, you can speak with us about whether there's some research that the class can, can do. And we usually, you know, work with the professor as well. And, uh, you know, to make sure that, um, you know, it's going to be useful to us as well as useful to the students. So, uh, but that is, you know, that continues to be something that we're very open to. That's wonderful. And, and just for your information, Ambassador Hachijian, um, UCLA does have a number of um, study abroad programs. Uh, many of those in Europe, as you know, Europe it it tends to be the a popular destination for uh, UCLA uh, students studying abroad, US students studying abroad in general. And it would be wonderful to, to work with your office, you know, before uh, maybe especially when we're launching new programs um, to see if there are opportunities to work together to prepare the students and maybe after students come back, have them, have them uh, then intern in your office, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you aren't already in touch with the consulates, they would you know, love to yes. meet the groups of students before they go out. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, there's a question about the Olympics. Are there opportunities for UCLA students to get involved as early as, as now? Yeah, so just to be, uh, let me explain a little bit how the Olympics work because it's different in every city. Um, so this is the third time that LA will host the Olympics and the first time we're gonna host the Paralympics. So we're mm -hmm. very excited about that. And we as the city kind of set the stage and then there is a separate nonprofit called LA 2028 that is actually producing the games. Um, and so our role is to work with them closely to make sure that you know, they have what they need in terms of sanitation and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, f fences installed or whatever it is that they need signage, you know, around the city. Um, and they're the ones who are really conceiving of what the games will look like, what the sports will be. Um, and so I think at the moment in the city, um, 
you know, I mean, I'm sure over time we will have job openings. Uh, right now, the, you know, we, the director of Olympic and Paralympic development is in my office. Um, I think over time, you know, it'll, the, that team will grow. Um, but LA 2028 is another place to look um, for volunteer opportunities, to sign up for volunteer opportunities and to, uh, and they may have actual, you know, real job openings as well. Great. And of course, you know that UCLA will be where the village is. Absolutely. So the, the athletes will be staying yeah, in the dorm. Village. And by yeah. then there'll be a purple line to connect yeah, exactly. the athletes village to downtown. Yes, we're looking forward to that. Although yeah. we still have to wait for six years, <laughs> six or seven years. Um, what is the, okay, so this is a hard one. <laughs> what is the city doing about the homeless population that seems to have multiplied over the past two years? That's a huge question, which uh, could be the subject of several webinars, but um, let me just give you my perspective that in the last four years, um, we have incre by incredible amounts increased the team, increased the money, increased the attention and increased the action around homelessness. It is absolutely an unacceptable scourge in our city and it is, not right that our neighbors and our brothers and sisters are living on the street. It is, it's just appalling. Um, and we're doing a lot. Uh, you know, we go to these international conferences and, and domestic conferences on homelessness and we're, we're, people look to us to, about our programs, right? Cause we're, there's no, there's no magic bullet. We're, but we're doing all the things. So we're building more temporary housing with services. We're building more permanent housing with services, permanent supportive housing. We are encouraging more development in general um, to bring housing prices down. We are working very hard at keep, keeping people in their apartments through things like um, uh, rebates on their water and power bills, paying back rent um, and um, helping with eviction defense. Um, and uh, I mean, and many, many more things uh, that, you know, um, that, you know, I don't think we have time to go into, but it's, it's a very robust program. We house, you know, this year so far, we have housed 13,000 people. And the previous year, I think it was 20,000 people. So it's not that we aren't finding housing. <laughs> we are, but people are still falling into uh, homelessness. But the good news about this moment is that we are getting state and federal assistance um, that is enough to make a difference at this point. So Project Room Key is something that's funded by the federal government. So that's turning um, hotels into um, homeless shelters, temporary homeless shelters. And then that's going to turn into Project Home Key, which is money from the state to make that permanent, make those those possibilities permanent. And we've learned a ton. We've learned a ton about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so we're, um, and we have an incredible team led by a wonderful guy who um, has his own lived experience and who worked for um, a homeless nonprofit for many, many years before taking on this job. Um, uh, and uh, he's leading the, the mayor's homelessness team, but it's a really, it's a city effort, it's a county effort, it's a state and federal effort. Um, and affordable housing is a global problem, uh, it turns out, uh, everywhere um, it, that housing prices are becoming unaffordable in cities. And so um, we have not yet had really engaged conversations with our foreign city partners about this, but I'm thinking it might be time to do that to see if there, you know, there's something that we can learn or something that we can share um, about how to do it. Um, more, faster, better, et cetera. Yes, this, like you said, this is a huge problem and, and uh, work in progress, right, to, to try to solve the problems. And then since you uh, talked about cities, and one of the questions that came in has to do with cities and diplomacy. And I found this question very interesting. Um, do you think that major cities should determine the future of diplomacy? And if so, what would it look like? I did not pay the person to ask that question. <laughs> Hey, nobody to ask any questions today. Uh, I, you know, I love that question. And in some ways we, um, I mean, we're, we're out there doing it. Um, you know, there, the United States is a little slow to this game. You know, there's, 
really only um, a handful of cities that even have international offices, let alone a deputy mayor. I'm the only deputy mayor of international affairs in the United States. New York has a commissioner and they have a, you know, a good setup, but they're focused very much on the UN for obvious reasons. Um, but in the rest of the world, you know, global cities are all over the place. They have, um, they host conferences, they visit each other, they have many networks, and we're part of most of those networks, or many of them at least. Um, but it's just not quite happening at the pace that it does in many other parts of the world. So not just Europe, but also Asia, also Africa, Latin America. Um, and, uh, and so I hope that we um, more and more um, are are helping and leading on, on city diplomacy. Because after all, you know, we will be, you know, I think it's like 60 or more percent of the pop of the world population will live in cities by uh, 2050. I can't remember the exact stat, but, and in the United States, it's already 80%. Um, so, you know, it, it will determine the welfare of a lot of, of people. And in order to really serve our residents well, we have to be out there learning and attracting and, and, uh, um, you know, and engaging with with our foreign counterparts. So, so um, I, I I should assume that you would uh, be in favor of more cities in the United States having an office like yours. Absolutely, uh, and I'm also in favor of having the State Department create an office of city and state diplomacy, which is really something that we need. Um, because you know, I'm I've been an ambassador, so I have a good network of people I can call and ask. You know, if I have a question about this or that, you know, head of state that's visiting uh, the you know Los Angeles, um, but not everybody has that. And um, you know, cities and states should have an office they can call to ask for help, and in turn, we can help with um, the State Department in all kinds of ways. Um, we are, for example, our port is the port. Um, that is part of a quad uh, green shipping task force. So the quad is a group of India and Japan um, and Australia and the United States. And President Biden elevated that to a head of state um, grouping. Uh, and so they have a green shipping initiative. And so it's LA that will coordinate with Yokohama and Sydney um, and Mumbai on trying to set up green shipping corridors and decarbonizing our ports, um, something that LA really is very ahead in, uh, in terms of the globe. Um, so that's just an example of where having, you know, city engagement is, is important. That's wonderful. I think th these are all great uh, thoughts and remarks and, and points for our students um, who are interested. And there's, there's so many questions that have come in. Uh, more questions than uh, we have time, and we'll make sure that these questions uh, will be uh, sent to you by email or uh, in another another format, so that you you have a chance to sort of look at these questions. And uh, some of these questions that come in really have to do with opportunities for students, for women, you know, uh, for for internships and and um, and for for working with your office. Uh, and, and so I would maybe close by one last question, trying to maybe put all these things together. And that is, um, is there any advice that you, you have that you uh, would like to share with our students who have really now just, you know, reemerged from a pandemic or to take in-person classes and who are really facing a variety of global issues such as uh, climate change, um, systemic racism, Living in the city of Los Angeles, what's your advice for them in terms of how they uh, prepare themselves? What should they be thinking about to potentially going into a career uh, that involves international work? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I'd say, first of all, take care of yourselves um, because, you know, you won't be help to anybody if you are, um, um, you know, uh, stressed, depressed, sick, whatever. So do take care of yourselves. And that can be hard in, a, in an environment where you may have to work as well as go to school, etc. Um, so that would be the first thing I would say. Um, and I'd say that, you know, a lot of issues um, that we've been, as we've been talking about, um, that are, you know, important policy issues uh, that seem domestic are actually international. So, um, 
if you want to stay in Los Angeles and um, you don't yet find the international opportunity you want, you could work on policy issues for LA and then make the global connection because they're there, they are there, whether it's um, you know, climate change, or whether it's affordable housing, whether it's um, you know, uh, gender equity, racial equity, there are counterparts of all those problems in other places. And I think um, the networks of the networks of people that you build internationally can be the ones that create the solutions. So, um, and I would just say in general, in terms of career advice, just you know, keep your focus on what you really care about. And you may have to take jobs that are not exactly aligned. You know, I think everyone's had to do that. Um, but you know that's okay you just keep you get it get out of it what you can and then you know continue to keep your eye on where you you know think you may want to go or what what is um of great interest to you and thank you so much thank you so much ambassador chichin for all your advice and for your uh great work for the city and and with our students and i also want to thank everyone who has attended this uh, webinar and for your engagement uh, with your questions and we hope that everyone will continue to join the rest of the events uh, in International Education Week uh, for the rest of the week. Thank you again, uh, Ambassador Hachijian. Take care. My pleasure. Bye-bye.